First of all, I'm very impressed with the fact that you had RO feeding your boilers. Uh, that's very rare, and that's something that I, I think people should start to consider doing. Beyond Clean offers a creative look into the inner workings of a healthcare industry committed to getting it right every instrument, every time. Join us every week as we explore the hidden world of one of the most important aspects of safe surgical care. And now your hosts, Michael Matthews, Hank Balch, and Justin Poulin. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with Jonathan Wilder, president at Stericert Company and managing director at the Quality Processing Resource Group, LLC. Dr. Wilder has worked with all thermal and chemical sterilization methods, as well as cleaning and disinfection methodologies, bringing his background in physical chemistry and surface physics to bear upon difficult problems in the field. He has been published in academic and trade journals and holds an MBA in technology technology management. He has been an active participant in Amy Sterilization Standards Committees since 1998 and, as of January 2018, is the co-chair of the U.S. Standards Making Committee for Hospital Steam Sterilizers. I'm looking forward to speaking with Jonathan for part one of this two-part episode uh, series with Jonathan. And the first part's going to be on the secret life of steam sterilizers, getting some real answers, talking about Amy work groups, which have been referenced several times on shows in the past. But we'll talk about tray weights and chamber cleaning and dry time along with instructions for use. So this one is going to be a must listen for all of the people who are following Beyond Clean. Yeah, Justin, and a lot of these questions that we're going to tackle with Jonathan are the questions that are being asked on the front lines in these departments, trying to get it done right and work their way through all the confusion, or you can say maybe steam fog out there to get it done the way that it should be done according to recommendations and standards. I can't wait to put Jonathan on the hot seat today, and like you said, get some real answers. Yeah, guys, there are few things that really strike fear into the heart of SPD techs and managers everywhere, quite like a steam failure, uh, wet load or something like that. Those things are the things that just terrify everybody. And so, you know, I'm really looking forward to talk to one of the leading experts on steam quality and start to learn what are the things that can go wrong and how can they go wrong. And a reminder, before we get into the interview, you can follow Beyond Clean on Twitter at Beyond Clean Info. Follow us on Facebook. You can find us facebook.com slash beyond clean podcast and on linkedin.com slash company slash beyond clean. The Instagram page is beyond clean podcast. And finally, if you have a future topic for the show or a recommendation for a guest, or if you want to share a picture anonymously to be posted on our Instagram page, send us an email to info at beyond clean.net. We'll be right back with Jonathan Wilder. Joining us now is Jonathan Wilder, President at Stericert Company and Managing Director at Quality Processing Resource Group, LLC. Jonathan, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. A real, real pleasure just to be here. In the first segment, we're going to talk about the secret life of steam sterilization and get some real answers from you. Let's start at the beginning. What's the role of Amy Okay, so Working Group 43, for those who don't know, is the working group that produces Amy ST8, the hospital steam sterilizer standard, and Amy ST55, the uh, tabletop steam sterilizer standards. I have the honor, as of about a year now, to be the co-chair of that group with uh, Susan Klasik, who is now working for Isham. And we have had some very good interactions with the manufacturers and other interested parties in the group. The current revision that we're working on is basically aiming at trying to uh, thin out the document a little bit and just get down to the brass tacks. The um, steam sterilization will not change. It's a mature uh, engineering and scientific exercise now. 
I think we know how to prove that it works. And the goal with this revision is to bring the document forward into the present as far as documentation goes, including electronic documentation, to integrate that into the sterilizer records and sort of define that for the current document rather than uh, letting everybody try to hack into the sterilizer control system to take records out using a tracking system or like a TDOCs or a sense of track or a microsystems or whatever. They're all doing a great job, but we're trying to make sure that the laws are followed. So discussion of 21 CFR 11, Code of Federal Regulations about digital signatures, came up in the last meeting, and that is, uh, well, that's hanging firmly in midair right now until we figure out what we want to do about it at the next meeting. So that's kind of where the revision of ST8 is. What's really nice about working in that group is we get very active involvement by the FDA. This is a standard that they have recognized, and so that means if you comply with ST8, your 510K submittal for a new steam sterilizer should be relatively straightforward. We have sort of shuffled around where the cycle definitions are. They used to be in TIR-12, ST79, and ST8. Now we're putting them into ST8 since the, um, the minimum cycle parameters are, will be there so that the IFUs for the sterilizers will be defined properly. So that's about where we are on the, the ST8 revision. ST55 was republished in 2016, and so that will not see any revision or review until about 2020, 2021. This one we hope to get out in a year or two. Nothing earth-shaking, just dealing with the usual progress, not in the sterilization itself, but everything that surrounds it. So one of the most common scenes you'll see as you walk into you know, any uh, sterile processing clean room is, you know, seeing a cracked sterilizer uh, allowing the instruments to kind of have an additional cooling and drying time. And I think there's a lot of questions about how long or if it's necessary or how necessary and all that stuff. And, and given that you're the resident steam expert, wanted to get your input on that. People have asked me this question before, and anybody who was foolish enough to ask me that question before knows I don't like cracked sterilizer doors, and I will tell you why. It's not that I think that, um, I'm not trying to be a purist about the process, but if you have a wet wrap on a load, uh, and it's a warm wet wrap on the load, it's not that good of a sterile barrier. And that means it's not a barrier at all. Since people's lives are at stake here, we have to consider that any failure in process can be lethal, as we've seen in other areas of our field. So I don't like it. That said, the likelihood, and this is all thought experiment here, the likelihood of an infectious bug getting through that stagnant air in, from the chamber and through a uh, the sterile barrier, which is still a reasonable challenge to get through, is pretty low. There, I don't know of any literature that has been published on this to say that it is good, bad, or indifferent, that it is not a barrier, but it's something to think about. And the reality here is that if the load is still wet after, let's say, 45 minutes of drying, which a lot of people seem to like to use, even though the IFUs tell you that you don't need that much, but reality says you do, then you have a problem with either the vacuum system for the drying or wet steam, and you're fixing the symptom, but you're not fixing the cause. And that is something we're going to talk about more, I think, when we get to steam quality later. But if you have to crack the door to let things air out a bit more, to let the humid air that's in the, in the chamber that's just been at almost a, you know, a very hard vacuum for the past 45 minutes, almost at no nothing in the chamber at all except for the load, then you're not getting all the air out, you're not getting all the steam out, and you're not getting all the condensation out, and you have a vacuum or wet load issue to begin with. That's really interesting, and I'm going to just play devil's advocate just for a second. I can already hear my technicians jumping up out of their desks to say, if you pull your hot instruments out, you know, even post-sterilization when they've been in there, they're still riding around 190, 200 degrees. You know, if you pull them directly out into a an environment where that is like 68 to 72 degrees, that's a pretty big temperature shock. Does that not run the risk then of condensation? Or is, in your opinion, is that a negligible risk compared to something, you know, like you said, being, you know, kind of clandestinely contaminated by being wet and just drying inside the autoclave? Well, it's the other side of the same card, actually. Um, they're, your technicians are absolutely right that if you have a hot, wet 
load and you put it into a cold environment, we all know, we've all seen presentations where we talk about, well, it's just like iced tea on a hot summer day in the South, that you get all sorts of condensation on the outside of the glass. And similarly, if you take a hot, wet item and you put it into a cold environment, you can get condensation. Is that absolutely true? The physics are the physics. They don't change. The question is, why is it still wet? And um, there are ways, there are very easy ways, actually. Uh, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, you have to stand there and watch the temperature display on, on the sterilizer because the records, the, the cycle tape records don't necessarily give you minute-by-minute minute, uh, information on the, the actual temperature inside the chamber. But the, the very easy ways of monitoring whether drying is happening correctly, the temperature should, should drop like crazy in the beginning of the drying phase and get down to a bottom uh, minimum level, maybe even 100 degrees F, so at uh, 30, 40s, give or take 40 degrees C, depending on what your machines are set for, and then start to go back up again. And they'll plateau off about 175, 180 F, or you know, about 70, 75, 80 degrees C. That big temperature drop in the beginning, and then the fact that it's coming right, rising back up, tells you that the water, which cools as it evaporates and is evaporated by the vacuum system in the drying phase, that the water has been removed if the temperature comes up. If the temperature doesn't come back up and just stays down there, either you've had a soaking wet load or you've got a bad vacuum system. You have bad vacuum systems for any number of reasons. The one that I worked on in uh, Colorado, so 5,000 feet, it was unfortunately not in a ski area. Uh, I didn't get to go play, but... <laughs> The boiling point of water is low enough to begin with, and on top of that, the water being fed to the vacuum system was rather warm. So they had very, very little vacuum pull, and they were unable to dry the loads in less than about an hour and a half. And they had to run long cycles to get things really, really hot, so they would be hot enough to dry off. You make do with what you're stuck with, but if you're having a problem like that, there are ways to improve the situation so that you can have a dry load coming out and not have to worry about it. And that way, you're not sitting there waiting another half hour for it to dry with the door cracked. You're not sitting there waiting two hours for it to dry, sitting in a drying area in, in the sterile processing. You know, Jonathan, you mentioned something earlier in your answer about the sterilizer receipt. And I've had folks ask mm -hmm. me before when that time is off on a sterilization stage by one second. And so you have four minutes and 59 seconds at the right temperature, but it's not that full five minutes. How picky do we need to be about that type of difference in our records and what that cycle is actually set for? Very good question. And we do want to be correct in this because, as I said before, we all know that this really does matter to people's lives and health, and we don't want to create infection. That said, the accuracy required of the timers in, in a sterilizer that complies with AMEST 8 is plus or minus 5%. So five minutes is 300 seconds, 5% of that is 15 seconds. You're still accurate enough, even plus or minus 15 seconds, to meet the standard. Is the load sterile? The load was sterile probably about halfway through the halfway through the cycle, and then you're nominally doing a twice the time it would take to kill uh, bugs on an instrument, spores on an instrument, or to kill a biological indicator. But in reality, if you're running at 270, 275 F, 132, 135 C, your sterility assurance level, which is supposed to be one chance in a million, 10 to the minus six early assurance level, you're more at like 10 to the minus 54. So the safety margin is huge. Do we cut back to one and a half minute cycles? Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but do we worry about one second at the end of a five minute exposure? Make a note of it, take it up with the manufacturer for the next service call, and no. That's a great answer. I've had an article title that's been sitting in the queue for probably nine or 10 months now called, Is It Worth the Wait? And it's all about instrument tray weights and, you know, issues with sterilizer weights. And so one of the things that I wanted to kind of pitch to you is what is that impact of tray weights, in particular per tray, on the ability of steam to sterilize? You know, so we're familiar with that 25-pound recommendation in terms of ergonomics, but there's multiple challenges with that across the board, you know, kind of what's your perspective on individual trays and then, you know, sterilizer total load weights as well. That's something I can't address very well. Um, I like the 25 pound weight because 
I was in a meeting where we pulled it out of thin air. I didn't say that. We didn't pull it out of thin air. We, we, followed, we looked at, there's a European standard for container weight that bases it on, on container density, and it's about 11 pounds per cubic foot, give or take. So if you have a two cubic foot container or one European standard sterilization unit, that's just uh, 12 by 12 by 24 inches, you're going to have uh, about 25 pounds. So that's where that came from in the history of the standards development. That and the fact that OSHA says you don't want to have someone lifting anything over 25 pounds without assistance. You can still have troublesome trays that weigh 25 pounds if there's a lot of plastic, if there's a huge amount of metal mass or both. Plastic does to heat up very fast, and it takes a lot of steam to do that, which the way steam heats things is by condensing and giving up the energy. So you're getting water, and you get water, you get condensate, you get you could get wet loads. That's why you don't want to overload the sterilizer. On the other hand, you do want to be productive, and steam is a marvelously capable heating agent as well as sterilizing agent. The only answer I could really give you for that, because I don't have a good one from personal experience, is that if the sterilizer manufacturer says, use, you know, let's say, let's pick a number, put no more than 200 pounds worth of stuff in the sterilizer per load, and I'm just pulling that number out of thin air, I don't remember what they say, you should not exceed that. If a sterilizer manufacturer says 25 pounds, uh, as some have said, and you just look at them like, but the carriage that goes into the sterilizer weighs more than 25 pounds, <laughs> so tell me the real truth. Yeah, well, you know, uh, so let me throw that, this out any of here. us who have got them off the tracks, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, we, we know that. bruises to show for it, that's right. Yes, we do. Um, well, you know, the challenge out there in the field, obviously, and I knew that you were going, you know, toward those sterilizer IFUs is, if you're not utilizing an automated tracking system that also has mm -hmm. your tray weights built in that can auto-populate mm -hmm. the weight of this load, it's going to be very difficult for you to be consistently compliant unless you just cook so little at one time that you're not even getting close to the maximum weight, right. which that's how you want to do it, you know, to be safe. That's fine. But any facility that does any orthopedic cases is going to be challenged in yeah. that realm if they don't have some kind of technology that's helping them keep compliant there. Absolutely. I didn't say it was straightforward. I think if you can sort of come up with, I know this is actually, I'm not even going to go there. I was going to start to say, well, if you come up with something like standardized loads, but that's not going to happen in the United States in the foreseeable future. Some people say it happens in Europe. I've seen what happened in Europe. It doesn't happen in Europe. Speaking of the sterilizers themselves and, and their limitations, mm -hmm. when we opened our new hospital, we had all new sterilizers. And of course, these things were just mm -hmm. beautiful and shiny on the inside when we first got them and started running them. And then our RO water filters that feed into our boilers got clogged up with sediment. And sure enough, our beautiful, shiny new sterilizers have all these, you know, hard water stains all over the insides of them. And it hurts my soul to think about. And it hurts me physically when I go and do a consult at a hospital and I see autoclaves that haven't been cleaned since autoclaves were invented. What is your recommendation on chamber cleaning? Is it just an aesthetic choice or does it really matter? First of all, I'm very impressed with the fact that you had RO feeding your boilers. Uh, that's very rare. And that's something that I, I think people should start to consider doing. I, I do know some of my favorite sterile processing managers who will remain, remain nameless in this conversation, but you all know who they are. Uh, they're, they're famous people in the industry. Um, are looking into that or going to that. And one of the sterilizer manufacturers was advocating strongly for local boilers with uh, RO feed at one time. I don't know if they still are. That's the perfect world, relatively clean steam being fed. And because we're taking a, uh, a device that's supposed to be clean and it's supposed to be sterile, and you're hitting it with this brew of various chemicals and water all in the form of steam coming from the central plant boiler, you think about it, they use that steam for heating, they use that steam for humidification, they use that steam for uh, steam tables in the cafeteria, they use that steam with the laundry if they have one. Nowhere except in the sterilizer does it touch anything that actually comes near a patient. And, of course, the things in a sterilizer come extremely near a patient. They come right in full contact with sterile cavities of bodies during surgery. So that is ironic. 
that said, working from that back to your question, you do want to have a clean environment uh, in which to sterilize your items because if you don't, then you will have the possibility of, uh, I'm going to use a real scientific term here, getting crud in the system, getting crud onto the wraps, which is, and that's what you're talking about, about the insides of the chambers not looking as nice as they used to. One of the, um, the article I wrote for Healthcare Purchasing News, it shockingly is almost 10 years ago now, one of the situations there was the facilities engineering people were adding boiler chemistry both into the boiler feed water and into the steam flow out of, coming out of the boiler, which is a no-no. And they had these beautiful brand new stainless steel sterilizers, which they had to scrub them every week to get the brown crud out of them. You want to use as little boiler chemistry as possible, but you do need to use some if you're not using a clean system, such as you described with RO uh, feeding the, the boiler so you'll have a pretty clean environment. But the system has to survive too, so that means there are going to be acceptable limits for the steam uh, additives. As far as cleaning the chamber, yes, please do. Uh, it, you're keeping a clean environment clean. It will avoid any possibility of uh, corroding the chamber. And as we all know, chambers, to replace a chamber is expensive, it's like the whole cost of a sterilizer. And this way, if you do have a clean chamber, then you're going to know that the chamber is collecting contaminants, and you can keep an eye on things because you have a visual telltale. If you have something that's dark brown from never having been cleaned, how do you know if it's getting any, any dirtier? You don't. And you don't know if, you have, if you're getting staining in the instruments or contamination onto the, onto the wraps or the, uh, the pouches, where it's coming from. You don't know if it's new. You don't know if it's left or, de or detergent, carbonizing. You don't, know, you don't know. So that's why you should clean the system. So, Jonathan, let's talk about dry time and also instructions mm -hmm. for use. Uh, where's, the, mm -hmm. where's the line there? Well, everybody I know who does this for a living uh, treats the instructions for use, uh, the drying in, uh, times and the instructions for use as a, as a bare minimum because most people don't have the luxury of perfectly dry steam. So you're going to get some problems, as I mentioned before. We're talking about wet loads happening, whether you like them or not. And generally, they do happen to some extent. You have to, of course, do at least the minimum dry time that the instructions for use tell you to do. Uh, otherwise, you're non-compliant with the manufacturer's instructions, and you're asking for trouble one way or another as far as uh, either not having a wet load which makes the people in this in the operating room very unhappy. I mean, you have to go at least that long. Uh, if you have specific IFUs for IUSS, which we all know nobody does, well, they do. <laughs> they have to. I mean, sometimes, but you know, going to a minimum is best. If you have specific IFUs for IUSS, uh, then you can do that for IUSS, but not for a standard load. Going from what the manufacturer tells you, so let's say. ABC orthopedics tells you uh, 16 minutes and you try it and you're on 16 minutes. They come out soaking wet. Well, that doesn't do anybody any good. And then you say, well, I always run for 45 for my drying. So I'm going to run for 45 and sure enough, everything comes out fine. Then you're fine. The long, a dry time is not going to be something that attacks instruments. It's going to be something that attacks your productivity. And if you can't get closer to the actual dry time that most of the instruments will show uh, in their IFUs, uh, either the steam is wet or the chamber is overloaded or the vacuum system isn't pulling a deep enough vacuum. I know I sound like a broken record here, but these are the three things that generally are going to be the cause of that. Um, steam being wet, we'll talk about that when we talk about steam quality, as we promised each other to talk about. Chamber overloaded. Uh, I know a lot of people who actually know what they're talking about who can tell you whether you're doing that or not, but I think everybody does know when they are doing it. And the vacuum system, not pulling in a deep enough vacuum, I already talked about how you can monitor that if you stand there and stare at the, uh, stare at the temperature gauge during the drying phase. And if it goes down, then up, then your vacuum system is working well. Uh, if you are reaching the vacuum um, that you're supposed to in the, uh, in the drying phase, then the vacuum system is working well. If either or neither of those happen, then you've got a problem. Yeah, and you know that the instructions for use issue, it's just in the wording, right? It's the way mm -hmm. that these are written that it just leaves the detail sort of up to question because, as you said, you have to do at least the minimum. 
But in many cases, right. people wonder, well, is there harm in extending it, especially on exposure time when you talk about different materials and makeups of the instruments and whether or not they're actually durable for that extended exposure time. And so you get into the weeds with it. It would be really nice if there was an adjustment to instructions for use that had more of a minimum and a maximum versus a specific stated number of time. I, I agree. I think it's a huge can of worms, and I, I don't have any good, straight, you know, any good simple answer. I can't just reach up and grab something out of thin air and say, "Shazam, you've got a, you know, here you are. You run everything for 18 minutes." But 18 minutes was a number that I, you know, for exposure, 18 minutes is not a number I pulled out of thin air. But that's what the French uh, require to ensure as much as possible that CJD doesn't become an issue for them. They'll, you know, use high alcohol and detergents in the wash and 18-minute exposures at uh, 134C, 273F. Most instruments probably can take it, but you have to, first of all, be able to read French and uh, get, the, get all of the French IFUs to see if that's true for your specific instruments. So that is not always easily done. And the other question that comes in then is, well, the FDA says you can't monitor a cycle like that. You don't have your biological indicators. You're dead at four minutes, ostensibly at 132. More likely they're dead at two, but who's counting? So how do you monitor the rest of the cycle? Well, it doesn't it doesn't become unsterile just because it ran longer. But on the other hand, you can't you don't know when it did become sterile if, this, if things aren't working right. So there is a validity to that question mark being raised. If you have something where you want to try to extend some cycles just to get a bunch of things in the same place, you, you unfortunately the only thing you can do is go to the manufacturer of the instruments and say, "Look, I need this, and can I do this?" And some of them are going to say no because. Well, you have our written IFUs. Others are going to say, well, we do that. And, you know, especially if you say, if somebody says, well, in France, <laughs> now, now that I've put that little bug in their ear, uh, you know, then they're, they're going to be able to, they may say, well, let me look into that for you. And if they, if they do find that they can run the instruments for that long without destroying them, everybody's happy. But until, until the manufacturer says that you can, you shouldn't. Because, I mean, okay, a $7 clamp is one thing, but something a little more expensive, you don't want to kill it. Well, you said you spoke two and a half languages off the air before we got started. And I think I know, <laughs> you, you said French was the half language, and I think I know how you right. learned it. <laughs> and actually, I, I learned it first, and then, uh, then, I, then I learned German and used it a lot more. And I, I lived in Germany for, well, I have spent about five years of my life in Germany at this point now. So it, it's a second home for me, and I actually had been to Tutlingen, where so many instruments are made, and I work with a testing laboratory who's you'll see all over the place, uh, SMP, who do cleaning validations and sterilization validations and durability testing of all things. And they do a lot of testing for instruments that have to go to France. So yes, I, I do have a little bit of a backstop there telling me that yes, this is possible. That's my foreign language acumen. I can get, to, I can get into a fight in about four other languages, but that's about it. So. <laughs> Well, that was a great anyway. first segment. Okay. We're looking forward to getting into some of the specifics of the fundamentals of steam quality in the second mm -hmm. segment. That was Jonathan Wilder, president at Stericert Company and managing director at Quality Processing Resource Group, LLC. Lots of good stuff in part one of this interview, gentlemen. But what I will say is the one that maybe hits the closest to home for me is just chamber cleaning. I can tell you it's a service that we provide at my company, and I can't tell you how often I've gone into hospitals where they don't do regular chamber cleaning, and they're wondering why those ugly stains are all over the instruments. So I thought Jonathan did a great job of talking about that topic and setting out some recommendations or guidelines for all of our listeners who have to deal with this on a day in and day out basis. Yeah, and I really enjoyed the the back and forth on the cracking of the sterilizer door. Like I said, that's a debate that we had even had internally, and so it's great to hear his input on that and give us some more information to kind of weigh out and decide what really is best. You know, guys, even though we have not had the opportunity to talk to an instrument tracking company on the show yet or, you know, folks who are experts in that field, I am a huge advocate of just how that technology can impact your quality in the department. And I thought that specific conversation about tray weights and total sterilization load weights was 
just hugely important. And hopefully the folks out there who are looking for a good excuse to put in that capital request for a tracking system, I hope this gets you halfway there. Definitely looking forward to diving into part two with Jonathan around the fundamentals of steam quality in our next episode. But that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to Beyond Clean on iTunes and Stitcher. We'd appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to us. And if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover in a future episode, or if you'd like to share a picture anonymously on our Instagram page, just send us an email to info at Beyond Clean. Clean.net. On behalf of Hank, Mike, and myself, thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond Clean.